I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, the first 10 verses. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming here to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep, and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of God to the people of God. And thanks thanks be to God. God. Now we all know that enthusiasm uh, is contagious. When you're around somebody that's enthusiastic, you can't help but kind of be lifted up yourself, more energetic, uh, and sort of excited. Of course, if enthusiasm is contagious, I guess you would have to assume that uh, someone who's not enthusiastic would sort of bring you down a little bit. Their lack of enthusiasm uh, is probably somewhat contagious also. Pastor Ed Roll uh, once wrote about uh, there was a famous uh, country music singer, performer, who was giving a live concert at a, at a county fair. And he said that she and her band gave a perfect uh, performance. They were polished, professional, they didn't miss a beat. But as he watched her uh, throughout the performance, he got the impression, and I'm quoting him here, She's not only tired, she's bored out of her mind. There was no enthusiasm in her performance. No evidence that she felt any of the songs, her songs, deeply within herself. Well, he <clears> says <throat> that on their way home, one of her songs came up on radio. And he says that he sang it along with the radio with more gusto and enthusiasm than she did. The concert at the county fair made Pastor Roll uncomfortable. It caused him to start to question his own preaching. As he studied and wrote his sermons each week, he began asking himself, do I believe this message is affecting my life? Is it making a difference in my life? If it wasn't changing his life, he questioned whether it was going to be beneficial for his congregation. And if he could preach it with enthusiasm. He says, I can fake sincerity pretty well, but contrived passion is ugly to watch. If we read our lesson today, we might consider the, the huge difference between fake sincerity and real passion and enthusiasm. Our scripture lesson for today begins with the words, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Why? Why did the tax collectors and the sinners gather around to hear Jesus? Oh, why do you rabbi? A member of the religious elite? Weren't they unclean in the eyes of God? Weren't they religious outcasts? And some rabbis were so devoted to protecting the word of God that they wouldn't even preach to or teach unclean folks, but not Jesus. I think the reason the religious outcasts, the social outcasts, were so attracted to Jesus is because they saw his enthusiasm, his passion for God. John Wesley, 
used to tell his followers, catch on fire for God and people will come and watch you burn. That's what Jesus did. He caught on fire for God and people came to watch him burn. That is, some of the people did. But while the tax collectors and the sinners were listening to Jesus' words, the religious leaders and teachers were grumbling about him. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now let that sink in for just a minute. Jesus, God in the flesh, welcomes sinners and ate with them. Mark Horowitz is an artist and a photographer based out of Los Angeles. And he was uh, doing a photo shoot one time for Crate and Barrel, the own decor company. And there was a white board in the background of the photo shoot, and there was nothing on it. So in order to make it more original or seem better, uh, he went back on the board and wrote Dinner with Mark. And he put his own cell phone number up there. So this made it seem a little bit more realistic. Well, after the photo was published, People from across the country began to call him. They wanted to see if it really was somebody's phone number. And they were surprised when they got somebody. But not just a few people called. 30,000 people called. Some of the calls were so pleased to actually get somebody on the other end that they were invited in to come eat to dinner. And whenever possible, he said yes. And he went. He began a new project that he called the National Dinner Tour. And he traveled all over the country having dinner with people who had called him on the phone number. What did he learn sharing meals with all these welcoming strangers? Horowitz says that he learned, quote, a lot of people are lonely and they just want to talk to somebody to reach out and connect with somebody. Can you imagine the loneliness of the tax collectors and sinners? I imagine they too just wanted to reach out and touch somebody, connect with somebody. So our passage today says, Jesus tolerated them. You know, that doesn't sound quite right, does it? Tolerated them. It says that he confronted them with their sin. Now, that, that doesn't quite sound right either. Actually, the Bible says that Jesus welcomed them. He ate with them. And this offended the religious leaders, of course. It's easy to read this Bible passage and for us to read it and feel kind of smug and self-righteous. I don't know, after all, we think we're on Jesus' side. At least we hope we are. But what kind of people offend you? Who do you tolerate but find it difficult to welcome? Who would you resist inviting to dinner? When Jesus wants to get an important point across, he usually tells one or maybe two stories. But in the 15th chapter of Luke, he tells three stories, all on the same theme. God loves us unconditionally. Period. And not just those of us inside the church walls. God loves those of us who are never walking the door of the church. God loves us those of us who have wandered away from him. God loves us and even though we aren't looking for him. God loves us unconditionally. And if God loves us unconditionally, can we begin to learn to love ourselves and each other unconditionally? The author, Dwight Small, writes, God does not love us for anything he can gain from his loving. 
It is not based on some kind of an exchange system. In no way does he love us because we are deserving or have earned it. He loves us and reaches out to us in grace simply because it's the nature of love to reach out. God is love and it is the nature of love to reach out. So after the religious leaders grumbled about Jesus, we read, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one son who repents. Now, I just read eight verses. And in those eight verses, there are five mentions of either joy or rejoicing. Are you starting to see a theme here? God takes joy in having a relationship with us. That's the whole reason for Jesus is coming into the world. God came looking for us when we were lost, separated. Jesus came to show us God's love, to restore us to God by sacrificing himself for our sins, even unto death on the cross. The author, Gene Fleming, tells a wonderful story about something that happened in her church one Sunday. The pastor announced that a boy named Crockett had decided to become a follower of Jesus. A little four-year-old boy out in the congregation stood up on the pew and he said, Yay, Crockett! <laughs> well, <clears throat> his mother kind of pulled him down and set him down. It may be all right to rejoice in heaven over the lost sheep who come on, but if you're in church, that show a little bit of corn here. So his mother thought. Katie Davis Majors was just 18 years old when she went to Uganda to work with the children in poverty that lived there. And she quickly fell in love with the country and the people. And not long after her ministry started, she adopted four Ugandan girls. As time went on, she got married, and today, Katie and her husband have 15 children, 14 of them adopted from Uganda. Her blog about her early years in Uganda it was turned into, it's been published as a book, Kisses from Kate. And in the book, she tells of a conversation with one of her daughters who asked her, she said, Mommy, if I let Jesus come into my heart, will I explode? And Katie said, No, you won't explode. But then afterwards, she got to thinking about it. She thought about it some more. And she realized that asking Jesus to come into our heart to change us to live in us changes everything in our lives. The Bible says we become a new creation. So Katie had to go back to her daughter and explain that when we ask Jesus to come into our heart, we will explode. We will explode with more love for others and more compassion. <clears throat> and we'll have more joy. God takes joy in having a relationship with and having a relationship with God is our pathway to finding happiness and joy in ourselves. It's what we were made for, a relationship with God. So what's standing in our way? What hinders us from having a relationship? Well, that brings us to the final thing I think we need to take from this scripture reading this morning. God is looking for you. God is looking for you. 
The question really is, do you want to be found? Do you want to be found? <coughs> Jesus uses the word repent two times in these verses. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Now that word repent literally means to change one's mind, to transform one's mind. Glenn Milner tells of suiting up in his combat gear in uh, Marine boot camp. And the drill instructor told the class that he would inspect their uniforms after they had their gear on. But one anxious Marine went running up to the drill instructor and he held out his helmet liner and he said, Sir, the private's helmet liner does not fit the private's head, sir. Well, the drill instructor was a little peeved because he had given them instructions on how to adjust helmet liner earlier and he said okay private this is what I want you to do go into the gear locker find a new head to fit your helmet liner and use that one <laughs> <laughs> well Jesus isn't asking us to get a new head but maybe we need a new way of thinking about God if we really and truly understood God's nature and God's purpose for our lives, would we let anything at all stand between us and God? I think not. All it takes is believing that Jesus is God and asking Jesus to come into our lives and change us to be more like Him. It's so simple we miss it. In 1997, a two-year-old Chinese boy named Wu was kidnapped from his parents' front yard uh, and sold to another family. Well, since the Chinese government had instituted their one-child-per-family policy in 1980, the officials estimated that some 20,000 children each year were kidnapped and sold to adopted parents. When actually Wu's parents were heartbroken, when their son disappeared. So for 24 years, his father traveled some 310,000 miles across China searching for his son. And he did all of this traveling, all of these miles on a motorbike, spreading and handing out flyers that had his son's pictures on it and telling about the fact that he had been kidnapped. In the process of searching for his son, he had uh, accidents, broken bones, <coughs> attacked by robbers. He spent all of his family's life savings. He slept under bridges and begged for money. But in his travels, he helped 100 other families find their kidnapped children. But he never stopped looking for his own son. And then last year, 20, 2021, in July, with the help of DNA samples and test results, Wu's father finally found him. He was working as a teacher in Henan province, about 400 miles away from where he had been kidnapped. Now, TV crews were there <clears throat> the moment Wu and his uh, weeping parents were finally united. I've said this before, and I'll probably say it again. Every story Jesus tells is a glimpse into the heart of God. If you want to know God's character, God's nature, God's priorities, listen to Jesus' stories. It's not hard to see the primary theme in these two stories today. God loves us unconditionally. God takes joy in a relationship with us. And God is looking for us. But do you want to be found? Do you want to be found? I say these things in the name of the Christ. Amen. Amen. We're turning to hymns to 348. Softly and tenderly. Of course, the other.
goodness, His grace, and His bad, God's willingness to forgive is far greater than your capacity to sin. And remember always where you heard it, here in this holy place. Go now, go with God, and fear not.